Is mid-Acts dispensationalism a cult? Now, here's what happens. You may have experienced this. If you haven't yet, you probably will. When someone comes to understand that you rightly divide the word of truth, and you think that the part of the Bible that's written to you today is Romans through Philemon, and you don't think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are written to you, or 1 Peter, or 1 John, some people will lose their minds. And then if they learn that you think Peter and Paul had different Gospels, which they did according to Galatians 2.7, when they hear that, they may lose their mind. You think there's more than one Gospel? There's only one Gospel. Well, Galatians 2.7 has two Gospels in the same verse. And so what happens is you may be accused of being in a cult. And so I want to take up that question tonight, and I want to think about it very carefully. So, is mid-Acts dispensationalism a cult? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to understand what the word cult means. And so I'm going to read to you here. This is from the Oxford English Dictionary, and I'll just read you a couple of the definitions, and we'll then analyze them and see how they apply. So, definition number one. The action or an act of paying reverential homage homage to a divine being, religious worship, now rare. So that was an early usage of the word cult, but that usage is now rare. I don't think that particular meaning is relevant to for our purposes. The next definition is 2A. A particular form or system of religious worship or veneration, especially as expressed in ceremony or ritual, directed towards a specified figure or object, frequently with of or modifying word. So the word, the definition in 2A is a particular form or system of religious worship. And again, I, I don't really view that definition as the definition that is most relevant to the accusation that mid ex dispensationalism is a cult. To be, or not to be is what Shakespeare said, but in our case, to be is the, is the, dic, is the dictionary entry that I think is most relevant. So let me read this one to you. A relatively small group of people, and people will say that when they say, how many people attend your church? And you tell them the number, and they're like, well, you must be a cult, right? If you don't have at least 500 there, you're a cult. A relatively small group of people having especially religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister or as exercising excessive control over members. And I would tell you that definition, 2B, of the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, is the, is the meaning that people most typically use or intend when they refer to something as a cult. And so if you were paying careful attention, there are really two aspects to that definition. The first is, it's, and I'm just going to read it again, a relatively small group of people having especially religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. So the first aspect of that definition is having beliefs that are considered strange. Then the second part is, or as exercising excessive control over members. So the first option, is you, if you will, is beliefs that are strange or that are at least perceived as strange. The second part is having excessive control over members. So we're going to consider both aspects of that definition. So let's first start with the view or the meaning, a relatively small group of people having beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange. 
Now, if you think about that for a minute, it doesn't say having beliefs that are false. It says having beliefs that are regarded by others as strange. What that tells you is the term cult is often a term that tells you more about the person making the accusation than it does the group because it's how the person perceives them. So think about this if you would. Noah's not on here, but if, if Noah was on the chart, he would be right there. Now, if you take this definition, regard, you know, having, let me have this, get this right, beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange. Well, you know what that tells you? Noah and his family would have been regarded as a cult, right? Were they a small group? How many people got on the ark? Eight of them, right? So it was a pretty small group. And were their beliefs regarded as true or were they regarded as strange? Perhaps they were even regarded as crazy. Now think about this with me just for a minute. How many years was the ark in preparing, according to the scriptures? 120 years, according to Genesis 6. Now, Genesis 6, and let's just look at it so we see it. But in Genesis 6, what God says here is, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in 120 years. That's not a reference to man's lifespan because people lived longer than that. Noah lived more than 120 years. It's a reference to there's going to be 120 years and then judgment will come. When you think about 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter 2 says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah was not just an architect. You realize he was the first architect. He was also a preacher of righteousness. So what does that tell you? Noah preached for 120 years. He was a preacher of righteousness. How successful was he as a preacher? Well, how many people joined Noah's house church? No one did, right? Because the people that got on the ark were Noah, Mrs. Noah, his three sons, and their wives. Every single person that got on the ark had the last name of Noah. That means in 120 years of being a preacher of righteousness, Noah couldn't convince anyone, hey guys, look, if you don't do this, if you don't get on the ark with me, you're going to drown. So Noah, Noah was no doubt regarded as a cult leader. And he and his family were regarded as in a cult. So what can we learn from that? Just because others think you're in a cult doesn't mean that your beliefs are wrong. Because obviously, about two minutes after it started raining, a lot of people wished they were in the cult. Right? Too late, though, unfortunately. If you then think about, let's just get Acts 17. Acts chapter 17. So in Acts 17, we see Paul, and Paul is uh, in, in Greece. Uh, so Acts 17, verse 18. Acts 17 and verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics, two of the most famous philosophical schools in Greece, encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others some he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. So you, you know this. As the Greeks think about gods, how many did they have? Well, they had lots of gods, right? They had the god of war and the god of victory and the goddess of the hunt, and they had this, that, and the other. They had all kinds of gods. So then they, count, they encounter Paul, and they say, well, he's a setter forth of strange gods. <laughs> He was a setter forth of the true God, wasn't he? 
He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. Why? Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. We'll go back to the definition of cult. If the definition of cult is someone having religious beliefs regarded as strange, what did people think Paul was in? They thought he was in a cult because he was a setter forth of strange gods. So what you see happens throughout time is that God's people, who are frequently described as a remnant, remnant meaning residue, meaning small, well, they're often perceived as a cult, but yet their beliefs are true. Their doctrine is true. Their, their teaching is accurate. It's just that they are perceived by others as strange because they don't follow the conventional false theology. So here's what's really happening. This is my opinion. When someone refers to a group as a cult, what they're really saying is, I think your beliefs are strange. Okay, so what? Why should I care what you think about my beliefs? Of course, what someone should do is if your beliefs are wrong, what they should do is instead of saying you're in a cult, which is really just a form of name calling, is they should take you to a verse and prove that your teaching is wrong. So when people refer to mid-ex dispensationalism as a cult, what they instead of, you know, I get it, you called us a name, you're saying that we're strange, I, I get it, I, I, under, I understand your insult, but why don't you prove that the beliefs are wrong from the Word of God? And if you can't do that, then you don't really have anything, do you? All you have is calling names. So that seems to me to be the, the right way to think about that. So is mid acts dispensationalism a cult? Well, may, other people may perceive it as strange, and they may think it a cult, but their perception really doesn't matter. The real question is, is the teaching true or is it not? Noah's teaching was true. Paul's teaching was true. So if someone says that we're in a cult because we follow Paul, well, Paul said, follow Paul as I follow Christ. It seems to me that we're just being scriptural. But let's go back to the definition of cult for a minute. So we dealt with the first part of 2B, having strange beliefs. But there's another part of the definition, and that is this, exercising excessive control over members. And I'm just going to give you my opinion. That's the aspect of the definition that is the most intriguing. Uh, because what it goes to is it goes to the tactics of how cults operate. So do mid ex churches exercise excessive control over their members? And I'm just going to tell you my opinion. For the vast majority, the answer is no, that they don't. And in fact, what I would tell you is the typical Grace Church has very little control over its members because their members do whatever they want to do. And, and, and the way I know that, I can tell you the ones I'm familiar with. The Grace Churches I've seen, people come whenever they want, and they don't come if they don't want to. They don't feel compelled to come. That they don't feel the need to, to be there. If they don't want to be there, they're not there. They're not intimidated. They're not forced to be there. If they don't want to be there, they don't go. The other thing I've noticed happens is sometimes people will just disappear and you won't see them again. Off, sometimes, sometimes they tell you, but most of the time they just disappear and it's up to the preacher to figure out over time that they've disappeared. Often you're never told why. Typically it's because you did something wrong, but you just don't know what you did wrong, but it's your fault. But my point is, 
that there's not excessive control. The people do whatever they want to do. I'll give you another example. What I find grace people do is they listen to any old thing they want on the internet, which is fine. It's their right to do it. I don't want control over that. But, but, I, but it's not something that is controlled because people do whatever they want to do. And so mid-acts churches, at least my experience, typically don't use any of the tactics of, of cults. They don't have excessive control over their people. Their people can do whatever they want. And in fact, they do do whatever they want. It's just the reality of what that is. So mid ex churches do not practice cult-like tactics. At least most of them don't, and the, the ones you know, that I am familiar with don't. But allow me to transition then into a, a different point, and that's this. I want to talk about cultish tactics in terms of control, because this is something that you just need to understand. And if you, let me pause for a minute and say this. You do know, of course, that Satan is the God of this world. And you do know that he has attacks against people that are doctrinal in nature. And we know, of course, from John 8, 44, that Satan is a liar and the father of it. So if he's the God of this world, if he's who this world worships, he's the prince of the power of the air, and he's a liar, what do you expect the world system to look like? Well, you're going to have to just embrace the fact, understand the fact, realize the fact that there's going to be deception throughout life. And there's going to be people that try to manipulate you. And they want to manipulate you because they want you to do something that they want you to do. And that's just, you know, that's how life is. It's how people are. So what I want to talk about next is I want to talk about some of the tactics that cults use. So this is not something that you see grace churches do very much, at least that I'm aware but you will see individual people do these tactics because they want to control people. And so the tactics to control people are used not just in church settings, but they're used in other settings as well. And for your own self-defense, you need to understand how some of these things operate. And so the single biggest problem with cults, in my opinion, is their use of tactics of mind control. And so we want to understand the types of tactics, the types of things that they do to brainwash, to influence, to manipulate people. All right. Now, when you see these tactics being used on you or someone trying to use these tactics on you, you should recognize them for what they are And you should get yourself out from under their influence because they cannot be trusted. Someone that uses tactics like this is not your friend. They're they're trying to manipulate you. So I'll give you an example here. Let's get into some specific tactics. One of the things that cults do a lot of, or that I'll just call it a cult-like tactic, let's put it that way, is isolation. And what they want to do is they want to separate people from their family and friends. The reason why they want to do that is if you're trying to influence someone, if you're trying to manipulate them, you want them listening to what you have to say. You don't want them considering other opinions. You don't want them receiving other sources of information. You don't want other people in their life that are important influencing them because you want to control them. And so one of the things uh, that is a cult-like tactic is to isolate people and try to separate them from their family and friends. Related to that, one of the things that, that they'll do is then they'll say, well, you can spend time with this person, but not this person. You can see this person, but not this person. You can go here, but, but not there. Because what they're doing is they're trying to control what 
information is available to you. They want to limit that information, again, because they they want to control you. What they'll then sometimes do is they'll tell you, here's who you can communicate with. You can't communicate with these people. You can't text them. You can't call them. You can't visit them because they're trying to control they're trying to control and shield you, uh, isolate you from other influences. And what they're really trying to do in that is they're trying to control your access to information because some of those folks may say things that are contrary or that even expose the manipulation that's being used against you. If someone is trying to brainwash you, they want to control what you hear. They don't want you to listen to something that would expose what they're doing, so they'll have lots of rules as to what you can do or not do. Another thing that that sometimes happens is uh, cults will want people to give up their personal possessions. Why do they want to do that? Well, it it makes makes the person dependent on them. It's a form of control. Another thing it does is it, uh, it, it, it does away with, in some sense, part of your identity. I'll give you, I'll give you an example of that. I've, uh, I've worn this on the show in the past. And what is this? This is just a little tie tack. It's a Spider-Man tie tack. Now, what is the value of a Spider-Man tie tack? Probably not much. Do you think that's worth 50 cents? I don't know. Maybe it's worth 50. Maybe it's worth 25. I don't really know. But it means a lot to me. Do you know why it means a lot to me? There was a very dear saint who gave this to me several years ago, a a brother that's in heaven. He was a grace preacher, a real defender of the faith. He was just a great guy. And he gave this to me. And did he give this to me because it's, you know, the the worth of, you know, 10 tons of gold? No, he gave it to me just as a kind hearted gesture. And this little thing that is in some ways worthless means a lot to me because it reminds me of my friend. And so what happens is one of the reasons that people that want to control you want to get rid of your personal possessions or encourage you to do that, is a lot of the things that you have remind you of the influences of people that are important in your life. And I'm not going to give up this. I like having this. So just want you to sort of recognize some of these tactics. So now let's turn to the next question. So what do you do? You see someone trying to manipulate you. You can tell they're limiting who you can interact with, what you can listen to. You can't listen to this preacher. You can't talk to this person. You can't visit these relatives. You can't be with these friends. So you perceive the tactics that are being used against you to control you. So what do you do? And let's understand from the scriptures what the response should be. So get with me 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Now think about that just for a minute. The Apostle Paul is writing to the saints in Corinth, and this is Paul, the Apostle, the Apostle of the Gentiles, and he says, not for that we should have dominion over your faith. Even the Apostle Paul, in dealing with believers, said, I don't want dominion. I don't want control over your faith. Your faith is is up to you. That's your free will choice. That's a, a matter of your conscience. I can't dictate to you what you should believe. I can't force you to believe what 
what I believe, and I shouldn't try. That's the real point. In other words, it's your right to believe. You have liberty in Christ, and it is wrong for someone else to say, well, you got to do this. You have to believe that. That's having dominion over your faith, and the Apostle Paul himself wouldn't do that, and he wouldn't stand for that, because he was insistent that believers have liberty in Christ. So I'll tell you, I'll give you a perfect example. If someone told me, well, you can't read this, you know the first thing I might do? (laughs) I might read it. Now, if they told me, you can't listen to this guy, you know what I'd probably do? Probably listen to that guy. And the reason why is this. When they say, you can't listen to this or read that, they're trying to limit your exposure to information. And it seems to me that the right way I should think about that is, well, I have liberty to listen to or read whatever I want. I might learn something in that, and you're trying to keep it from me. Maybe I won't learn anything in it. Maybe it's garbage. You know, that that sometimes is the case. But the point is, I need to have the liberty so that someone else doesn't have dominion over my faith. Anyone that starts to tell me, you can't listen to this, you can't read that, I don't trust. And in fact, what I would do because I don't trust them is I do the opposite of what they want me to do. Because if they're telling me, don't read this, then I'm probably going to read it because there might be something in there that I need to know. Now, what's the next step? Get with me 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, this is a very important point, and, 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 I, and I hope you get this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Fascinating phrasing there. You know what happens when you believe false doctrine? The person you hurt is yourself. You're not hurting the Apostle Paul. You know, you're not hurting me. Um, When you believe something that's false, what you end up doing is you harm yourself because it is destructive to believe things that are spiritually incorrect. So that's why Paul says, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, because they're in false belief. Now notice what it says. says, If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. What happens is, when it talks about the acknowledging of the truth, the truth is there. It's present. It's available. And what people need to do is they need to just acknowledge it. They need to admit it. Now, notice verse 26. This is absolutely fascinating. So in verse 25, it's those that oppose themselves. It then talks about God giving them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And notice what verse 26 says. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So when it talks about the snare of the devil, it's a trap. So ponder that just for a minute. How do traps work? Well, what traps have is they they always have some sort of concealment to them. In other words, there's something that's going to bind or grip the victim but it's not immediately obvious prior to the trap being activated. It's covered up. It's concealed. Now, notice what this then says. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by his will. So what happens is there's a trap. People are taken captive. And the part that I want to emphasize here is this that they may recover 
themselves. There's only one person that can get you out of satanic deception. And you know who that is? It's you. I can preach all day long. Other people can preach all day long. We can show you verse after verse after verse after verse. You know the only person that can get you out of the trap of deception? It's got to be you. Because you know what the truth of the matter is? You have free will to remain in deception as long as you want. There are people that spend their entire lives believing a false gospel. It's tragic. It's sad. But it is their free will choice. And people sometimes choose to do that. The only way you can get out of a trap, the only way you can get out of a false belief, is you have to recover yourself. So how's this relevant to cults? Well, the cult, the, the cult-like tactics of mind control and isolation and controlling access to information and all of those things, you know the only person who can get you out of it. Your best friend can't. Uh, your parents can't. They may love you. They may want you to come out of it. But you know the person who has to choose, who has to make the choice to come out from under the influence of cult tactics? It's the person who's the victim. That's the only person who can do it. It's just how it works. Because you have free will to choose. And then the, the, the next point I'll make on this is, what you do is, when you see, when you perceive that these tactics are being used against you, and you perceive that people want to control you, they want dominion over you, you then understand, I'm the only person that can resolve this. I'm the person that's got to get me out of this situation. So the thing you need to do, once you realize that, is you need to get out from under the influence of those that are trying to manipulate you. Now, when you do that, are they going to like it? Well, they're not going to like it because they're trying to control you. And so when you say, well, I want to do this, well, no, you don't want to do that. They're going to try to talk you out of it. They're going to tell you you can't do it. They're going to tell you why it's a bad idea. But the thing is this. The moment you perceive that those brainwashing, isolation tactics are being used against you, you need to understand that you've got to get out of that situation. It is dangerous. It is harmful. You are less likely to perceive the truth in that situation because your information is restricted. So what you do is you say, I'm not sure what I'm in right now. I don't know. But the best way for me to figure out is to get outside of the situation and look at it from a fresh vantage point. Right now here in the bubble where my information is controlled and my access is limited, I'm not going to be able to see clearly. I'm not going to have the perspective to do it. So what do I need to do? I'm going to step outside of it. They may not like it. Well, that's, that's okay. That's too bad. Listen, if they're completely sincere, if they have your best interests at the center of their motivation, they won't, they won't mind because they're doing nothing wrong. So you can step outside and it won't look any different. But if they won't let you step outside, they've got a reason why. So what you need to do when you find yourself in these situations is you need to get yourself out of the situation as quickly as possible so you can look at it from the outside and perceive it for what it really is. Maybe you'll get outside and you'll think everything's hunky-dory. But oftentimes when you're being manipulated and you get outside, you now see what was really happening. You owe it to yourself to get outside so you can see, see the truth. Now, let me make another point on this. You, you realize that as you go through life, the, the ongoing challenge is, is to, to figure out what's true, right? Because the world is so full of lies and deceit. 
And so what you're periodically going to have to do is you're going to periodically have to think through things and re-examine things. And you need to be in a position where you have liberty to do that. Anyone that wants to take away your liberty does not really have your best interest at heart. That's just the truth of the matter. You need to accept that. Doesn't matter if they smile. Doesn't matter if they act like they're protecting you. If they are restricting your liberty, your freedom of thought, your access to information, they don't have your best interest at heart. That's the truth of the matter. That's just the way it, way it is. You need to accept it for what it is and figure out a way to get out from under it. What if you're in that situation? You say, well, you know, I'm not sure. Are they using tactics to manipulate me or are they not? I mean, they seem real nice. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I'm not, I don't know if I'm in, I don't know if I'm in that situation or not. I don't know. I don't know. Well, what do you do? Well, if you're not sure, the best thing to do is step out of outside of it and get sure, right? Because if it's completely innocent, you'll step outside, you'll say, this is legit, no problem. But it's so, it's, it's so often the case that when you step out and you get a different perspective, you just see things a little differently than how you perceived them before. So that's just some encouragement, if you will. We live in a very, um, a world that has a lot of deception. We live in a world that has a lot of manipulation. And what we need to do, uh, what, we, what we owe to ourselves, is we owe it to ourselves to, to protect our liberty in Christ. We owe it to ourselves to have the ability to think for ourselves and to associate with who we want and to have access to what inform, whatever information we want.